So, whereas the national average is 35%, the state of the art is between 70 and 80%, and most of those zero waste communities, uh, Austin, Texas is one among them, Alachua County, Florida, um, are shooting for 90%. Alachua County, Florida is an interesting uh, situation because the state of Florida has declared a 75% uh, recycling mandate, uh, however, incineration is included in that mandate. So in the southern part of the uh, state, you don't have to do any recycling, they're burning everything. Uh, but in Alachua County, where Gainesville is located, uh, the county is shooting for 75% uh, diversion without incineration. So again, uh, cities and counties are making uh, very, uh, very good progress. Uh, another resource uh, that uh, you uh, communities can use is the business plan for zero waste developed by the city of Austin, the Department of Resource Recovery. Uh, it is up on their webpage, and it's uh, an invaluable uh, document uh, for planning for all kinds of recycling, reuse, and composting. Um, we uh, we we talked about the uh, uh, the uh, the benefits. Of, uh, of companies locating in your community, taking your processed raw materials, and then making an end product out of them. Um, just to give you a, a sense of how this works economically, if you have all kinds of mixed paper in a big pile, uh, newsprint, um, uh, high-grade white paper, uh, or, uh, corrugated, you'll get a very low price for that per ton, maybe anywhere from 10 to $20 a ton. If you segregate out all, separate out all the different uh, types of uh, paper. Uh, your high grade will get you uh, close to $200 a ton. Your corrugated will get you $90 to $100 a ton. And your newsprint will probably get you $50 or $60 a ton. So the concept of high grading is, uh, as processing is incredibly important. And once you high grade, you have raw materials to attract energy, uh, to attract companies. And here are some of the key companies that we work with uh, to uh, bring in uh, new companies to create jobs and to provide local markets within cities and counties that are doing high levels of recycling. Uh, one the company is called Gray's Paper Company. Uh, they're a 40 ton per day operation. Uh, they take 36 tons a day of high grade paper, mix it with uh, four tons a day of, of li old linen, uh, sheets, towels, uniforms, etc. And they produce uh, perhaps the only 100% uh, recycled newspaper in the world. Uh, there's no virgin material, no chemicals, it's all uh, mechanically processed. And um, that company is looking to build scores of plants in the United States, one for every major metropolitan area in the country. Uh, it creates about 120 jobs, it needs five acres. It's a $10 million plant, but the company has all the capital it wants and it, can, uh, it will also allow local investors. Uh, another company is called FlexPave. They take uh, rubber tires, they crumb it up, meaning very fine grains like sand, and they uh, use it to make a, a surface, a road surface, street so surface, that is permeable, and as a result of that, they, um, uh, the water flows through the material into the ground, saving your wastewater treatment millions and millions of gallons a year from processing, and therefore also reducing chemical use. Uh, there's a company called New Life Glass out of the United Kingdom. Uh, their first plant is being built in Buffalo, New York. Uh, they take uh, CRT screens from TVs and old computers, and uh, they have a technology that separates the lead from the glass, and they um, sell the separated materials to industry. Um, uh, there's Bill Kuhn Manufacturing in a little town called Spickard, Missouri. Uh, they take recycled PET and recycle, excuse me, recycled HDPE and polypropylene and manufacture a whole array of products from docks, boating docks, to helicopter seats, to uh, just about anything you'll see that's plastic in a uh, fast food restaurant. Uh, these are the types of products they make from their three technologies, uh, sheeting, uh, vacuum forming, and rotational molding. Um, and that uh, that, as you will see on the chart, that gives the type of cap uh, amount of capitalization, number of jobs, and the amount of uh, area uh, needed for, for each business. Um, Bioponica out of Atlanta is a very interesting company. They build small greenhouses. Uh, they uh, grow duckweed and algae from compost uh, materials. 
feed it to fish. The fish waste uh, becomes the nutrients for vegetables. And in one site in Atlanta at the, at the, uh, at the um, compound of City of Refuge, which is a, a shelter for 200 women and children, there's a uh, greenhouse that's operating. It is supplying food. Uh, the, the, the compound uh, needs to feed, uh, have 20,000 meals a month. So they're raising a lot of their own food. And they're surrounded by a very low income community, which is in a food desert. And they have now implemented a food truck that goes around selling fresh fish and vegetables to low income people at reasonable prices. Uh, so for those of you who live in cities where there are food deserts, a small bioponica operation um, would be uh, a quite a benefit to the community. Um, Echo City Farm is a, uh, a non-profit version uh, of bioponica. They have different types of greenhouses uh, and they do traditional composting and uh, worm, uh, worm uh, uh, vermicomposting, worm composting. Um, Greenway out of, out of Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, is a company that specializes in composting food waste and other organic matter and uh, the Institute works very closely with them as we go into cities and plan their organic uh, strategies for recovering the organics and processing them into, into compost which then leads to flowers, food uh, and uh, potential sources of en uh, energy uh, if you want to use anaerobic digestion. Um, so uh, the uh, Oh, uh, the, uh, well, I did mention St. Vincent de Paul earlier, and they're also uh, on, on the chart uh, indicating uh, the reuse companies that they uh, can help, uh, com uh, help communities uh, replicate uh, in, their, uh, in their local areas. Um, the, the principal strategy um, for attracting these companies, one, you have to know about them, and you have to be interested in bringing them to your, your community. Um, and that means you have to do some courting. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Simon Greer, uh, the principal in the New, uh, New Life Glass, which is the company that separates uh, lead in, from glass uh, in CRT screens. Um, he gave a lecture in Harrisburg, oh, uh, let's say six months ago. And uh, after that lecture, he had <laughs> hundreds of uh, emails and phone calls from cities that wanted a plant like that, which means there's competition. Uh, and uh, there are certain things you can do to make your community uh, look a little better than the next community. Uh, you can have an inventory of private sector and public land that's available for development. Uh, you can indicate what levels of infrastructure are needed or completed uh, on that site. Um, you uh, can have a very short brochure of what your city uh, can do with industrial revenue bonds, uh, with workforce development funds. Uh, most of these companies have their own capital, but of course they want to leverage their capital and they would uh, want to take uh, the advantage of existing programs, uh, such as these bond programs and workforce development programs. Um, the, the key is access to materials. Um, the, uh, the competition for the resource supply is critical. It's a zero-sum game. The wasters are going to get it or the recyclers are going to get it and uh, there's no in-between uh, and therefore uh, it's a long struggle uh, to, uh, to um, confront very large companies with large capital uh, and also to confront entrenched ways of thinking uh, that uh, the big companies are the only companies that can handle our problems which is just not the case uh, the larger the company the more you usually have to pay for solid waste management uh, another rule of thumb is that uh, cities and counties that listen to their organized citizens always wind up with cheaper and more less expensive and less polluting uh, solid waste systems than, than cities and counties that want to push through a new landfill or a new pyrolysis plant or a new uh, garbage uh, uh, mass burn plant. Um, uh, so how can you get access to these raw materials to attract these companies? Well that's where uh, the work of the Depart uh, Department of Resource Recovery in Austin uh, can be very helpful. Read their solid waste management plan and you will see how that city of about 900,000 people is going to go about, is going about, making sure that the materials don't get mixed uh, and that uh, uh, they are made available uh, to companies that want to come in or existing companies in their local economy. 
Um, Austin is a city that is building an industrial park, a resource recovery park. So is um, Alachua County, uh, Florida that I mentioned. Uh, Reading, Pennsylvania just acquired a 50-acre site in the middle of the city uh, where they're hoping to attract uh, companies. And the state of California really initiated all of this back in the 1980s when they implemented um, the uh, recycle market development zones. These are industrial parks in rural and urban areas uh, and if you locate in them, uh, only recycling companies can locate in them and if you do so, uh, you will get reduced taxes on your uh, equipment purchases, I believe there are reduced energy taxes and other and loans and uh, loan uh, uh, grants and loan guarantees. Um, so these are, are the types of things that a company is looking for uh, to uh, to make a decision as to choose one city or another. Um, the uh, um, I mentioned that this is uh, a zero sum game, and uh, another adage in our industry is that if you uh, you you put your materials in a garbage truck you will never get those materials back for resources again. Uh, and as uh, Mary Lou Vandeventer from Urban Ore in Berkeley, California says, uh, a garbage truck is a perfect marriage uh, with a landfill or an incinerator. Uh, now there are technologies that are being promoted that claim you can get uh, recycled materials from mixed waste. These are called dirty MRFs because they try to recover uh, useful materials from mixed garbage. Um, it, uh, we do not believe that's the way to go. Uh, we believe that means if you get a dirty MRF, it means that within a few years there's going to be a proposed incinerator at the end of it. Uh, and the materials you get are uh, hard to market because they're contaminated. Glass is contaminated, uh, excuse me, uh, newsprint and other paper are contaminated with shards of glass. Uh, when the paper goes through a rolling mill, uh, the glass shards uh, get caught in the machinery. Uh, and it's very expensive to clean and shut down the whole operation. So the more you separate, uh, the more uh, valuable your raw material is, and the sooner you're going to be attracting end-use companies to your uh, locale. Um, uh, uh, w uh, one of the pioneer companies and great institutions um, uh, in our movement, is, as I er mentioned earlier, is Berkeley, Berkeley's uh, Urban Ore. Uh, I urge you to visit their webpage, to visit their site, because you'll see how they set up what, what they call the 12 category sort. Um, uh, if you categorize all your waste, excuse me, all your discards into these 12 categories, there will be nothing left over and nothing will be left out. And these categories were designed to relate and link directly to markets. So in each of these 12 categories, they have identified markets for materials pro properly uh, segregated and processed. And, and that uh, is another essential tool uh, for attracting uh, good companies. In fact, uh, Urban Ore itself attracts companies. They supply maybe 30 or 40 other reuse companies in the Bay Area, uh, and they, uh, they attract businesses. Every time they open up a site, uh, uh, restaurants open up because there's a, a flow, a daily flow of hundreds of material uh, people bringing in materials and purchasing, purchasing materials to take home. Uh, so uh, Dan Knapp of Urban Ore likes to say that they're the antithesis of Walmart. Uh, Walmart closes local businesses and Urban Ore opens local businesses. And that's a very nice dynamic to think of. The last topic I'd like to um, cover uh, is a, a pretty new topic. Um, it's called Extended Producer Responsibility. And um, the term has an interesting history. It, the term used to be extended product responsibility. Uh, this goes back to the 70s, maybe the 80s, where EPA and the large uh, consumer corporations, the brand name corporations, uh, wanted to sell people on the idea that we're all responsible for this waste. Therefore, we're, we're all responsible for the product. Uh, it gets back to the same philosophy as the crying Indian in the late 1960s, where the uh, beverage uh, industry put up uh, the crying Indian, Indian with the ads uh, behind it, indicating that we're all responsible for this material, uh, even though it was these very companies which stopped uh, refilling their bottles and went to a one-way system, meaning they externalized their cost 
of dealing with the bottles to the public while they increase their, their profits. Well, um, the citizens' and grassroots efforts led to the changing of the concept from extended pro product responsibility to extended producer responsibility, which put the responsibility for physically taking back the materials or paying for the, the government service to handle those materials. Um, this system has proved very effective in dealing with hazardous materials, uh, paints, um, uh, mercury switches, uh, uh, a, a whole variety of uh, batteries uh, are, are another one. And um, the companies have started taking these back. There, there are many excellent programs around the country that do this. Um, but around, I'm going to say 2010, um, there was a new industry thrust. And that thrust was to impose a different kind of EPR. Uh, the reasoning was that if, the, if our corporations are responsible for this, we want to own the system. And they started promoting a, a, a system that I called brand name monopoly EPR, which meant that when the EPR system was set up, citizens and local government abdicated all authority over the issue, all capacity over the issue, and all responsibility over the issue, and said, industry has taken care of it, we don't have to think about it anymore. Well, if you remember back to a few minutes ago in my talk, I pointed out that local decision-making, local authority, was the key to citizens making their impact in this sector. Uh, so this brand name Monopoly EPR, if implemented in the United States, would mean a dramatic fundamental change in how decisions are made on solid waste management, recycling, and uh, economic development. Um, the uh, uh, what, what I'll call corporate EPR, brand name corporate EPR, has been implemented in Ontario Province, Canada, and British Columbia uh, Province, Canada. And uh, it's not gone well. Uh, a monopoly have, has been set up in the form of product stewardship agencies, which are dominated by the corporations, uh, and they set the rules. I won't go into the details, it's fully documented. Uh, the bottom line is that um, companies are being driven out of business, independent, uh, companies that don't adhere to the very strict guidelines of the corporate, uh, uh, corporate dominated EPR stewards, um, they're being driven out of business. In fact, just this week, uh, we learned that Sims Metals, one of the largest uh, metal recycling and electronic scrap recycling company in the world, uh, is closing its facilities in British Columbia and Ontario uh, because of the, um, uh, the uh, burdensome structures that the EPR stewards are putting on these uh, these companies. Also we've learned about a month ago from Germany that Germany is now dismantling its corporate dominated EPR system mainly because they discovered lo and behold that a monopoly is bad for competition and as a result of their studies they found that um, uh, the cost of recycling through the corporate dominated system was twice as high as uh, a competitive uh, companies uh, doing the recycling. So they are actually dismantling uh, the monopoly uh, for EPR in, uh, in, in Germany and other uh, European countries as well. Those European countries are also taking a, a, a big step back from incineration, uh, which is reinforcing what's happening uh, here in the United States. Happily, uh, there's been a very lively debate against uh, corporate EPR. And uh, in the last, oh, I'm going to say, two months, there's been a major breakthrough uh, between the two sides uh, uh, talking at each other, complaining about each other. Uh, it seems that there are a good number of compromises now, mainly because of the sex success of the main uh, EPR law for, um, uh, for um, uh, excuse me, uh, the EPR law for electronic scrap. There, the companies are required to buy back an equivalent amount of material uh, based upon their sales in, the, uh, in, in that state, in that jurisdiction. Uh, an example is if you sell 100 units of your, your e-scrap, e-products e, e in the state of Maine, you have to purchase 100 units of e-scrap back. But uh, you have to buy your e-scrap through local companies, which means that the money uh, stays locally and the raw materials stay locally. 
Uh, reuse of computers, as we've seen, is a major job creation uh, creator. Uh, 296 jobs for 10,000 tons of material handled. But in addition to that, it's a transfer of wealth and knowledge uh, trying to bridge the digital divide. Uh, when you reuse a computer and sell it at uh, hundreds of dollars compared to thousands of dollars or fifteen hundred dollars, you are allowing lower income people to gain access, low income schools, low income community groups, uh, and that's why recovering reused machines is a social necessity as well as it being very economically lucrative. Um, the, uh, the, the compromise that we, uh, we're coming uh, 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 to with the uh, with the uh, EPR advocates for corporate control um, is an ongoing uh, battle uh, in Connecticut. They just passed a uh, mandatory mattress recycling law, which is a uh, very uh, good thing to do. However, when they set up the rulemaking authority and the uh, agency that's going to control it, uh, there's there are no uh, there are no grassroots group. There are no small companies, even though there are small recycling uh, mattress companies in the state. Um, and this is what, uh, what we think is a problem. And the key problem is that when EPR, Take Back, was focusing on dangerous materials, mercury switches, batteries, etc., we don't want those things in our community. So industry is taking them back and uh, presumably uh, handling them properly in terms of environmental pollution. But when there are markets for, for products, paper, mattresses, uh, glass, plastic, uh, we don't want a monopoly coming in and taking these materials because we want small-scale businesses to emerge. Uh, in the last five years, businesses have emerged, dozens, uh, scores of businesses have emerged in composting, uh, uh, building deconstruction, uh, reuse of computers, repairing cars, etc. Uh, it, it's, it's a mini-economic uh, grassroots upsurge of small businesses uh, emerging in cities and in rural areas. Um, I'm 69 years old. I do remember growing up in Brooklyn in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, I had very specific chores. Um, one of them was to take my father's shirts and the neighbor shirts uh, to the shirt hospital on Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn, where uh, your collars would be re replaced or repaired, and your uh, you, you could use your shirt for another few years. Uh, there were also fix-it shops on every commercial area in uh, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, every few blocks there was a commercial area, there was a fix-it shop. Uh, these have disappeared now. We need them to come back. We need um, zoning uh, ordinances, we need tax benefits for these companies to reopen because these are not only job creators, these uh, companies keep uh, products in our economy lasting longer. And that is a key to both uh, environmental uh, progress and economic progress. Um, <clears throat> we believe that the compromise uh, that we seem to be approaching uh, between corporate EPR and locally controlled EPR uh, is very well defined. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> the city of Berkeley, California, has a zero waste commission, and they um, passed a, 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 an ordinance, a, re a resolution, which was adopted by the city council unanimously that put EPR uh, rulemaking under the authority of local government, not in the hands of an independent, corporate-dominated um, agency that has total control. And we think that is the proper direction, and we think that is uh, the way things are going to come to, to fruition over the next few months. Uh, there will be a special webinar uh, with, uh, with me on it and with Matt Prinville uh, from Upstream, uh, who has been advocating, uh, 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 which in the past has been advocating for uh, corporate dominated EPR and we seem to be coming to uh, middle ground which is, which is a very good thing. So let me end this uh, lecture uh, by saying that um, uh, things have changed very rapidly in my lifetime. Uh, we've gone from uh, no recycling after World War II to very si significant recycling and recycling and economic development is now understood, even though it does have its enemies in the landfilling and garbage incineration and garbage hauling industries. However, uh, we seem to be winning, uh, slowly but surely, uh, over time. We've defeated incinerators, we've defeated mega landfills, uh, we've created space for small companies uh, to emerge where there were monopolies before that. and. Um, 
mainly we have captured the hearts and minds in our culture. Uh, children now know about recycling. There's a wonderful rock and roll video that was done by the Take It Back Foundation, headed up by uh, Jolie Jones, uh, that is available on uh, YouTube. Uh, just I think you could look it up as Yakety Yak, the recycling song. It's an old rock and roll song that uh, has been changed into a recycling song with many of your uh, of our uh, favorite uh, superstar singers uh, performing. It's a fun video. It's about three minutes. Um, I went around the country with Jolie, uh, bringing that to high schools and elementary schools, and it uh, it proved a quite popular way uh, to get uh, young people in uh, involved in uh, recycling. And um, once you get the kids, you capture the rest of the household, um, and you can relate to that if you're driving in a car and you've got a kid that knows about seat belts and a parent doesn't have a seat belt on the young person will let you know uh, just as that young person will let you know when you put a glass container in the garbage bin when you can put it a few inches over in the recycling bin. Um, so let me end by just indicating some of the uh, what I consider the best resources available uh, in this field of uh, decentralized uh, recycling and economic development, zero waste if you will. Some people call it total recycling. Um, uh, I'll mention of course my organization, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Since 1974 we've been providing technical assistance to cities, small businesses, local governments in the area of decentralized economic development through reuse, recycling, and composting. Um, I mentioned uh, two of our, uh, 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 several of our uh, books, uh, we, we will list those for you uh, in a uh, PowerPoint. Um, the Grassroots Recycling Network, uh, starting in 1995, as I mentioned, they are con uh, convener of many, many zero waste uh, training uh, programs for government, for private sector groups. Uh, and by the year 2005, uh, they helped create the uh, uh, Zero Waste International Alliance, which of course uh, covers uh, uh, global issues and every two years uh, they have a nas uh, an international meeting. Uh, we had one in Oakland a few years ago. Uh, there was, they've had them in South Africa, in Brazil, and um, the next one is coming up in uh, British Columbia uh, in October of two 2014, uh, which is in a few months from now. Um, uh, BioCycle magazine is an excellent source uh, on composting as you would imagine, but they also cover uh, some recycling and their scientists uh, are uh, top-notch uh, and uh, it's a very helpful magazine and I suggest you uh, you get that uh, if you want to get involved in this particular sector. Um, U.S. Composting Council has, uh, it's a national group but there are also state councils, excellent source of information. Um, Building Materials Reuse Association uh, that is the Trade Association for Building Deconstruction. Sensational people are involved in that uh, group. There, oh, there are at least 400, maybe 500 new companies in the past five years, taking down buildings, recovering very valuable materials, and then reselling them or repurposing them. Um, there are dozens, uh, if not scores, of local anti-incineration groups. Uh, they have a wealth of knowledge. In fact, uh, uh, Caroline Etter, uh, who we uh, work with in Frederick County, uh, she is perhaps now the foremost uh, expert on analyzing contracts for garbage incinerators. She's quite a whiz. Uh, and other, other grassroots people have acquired uh, great expertise in these issues and are available for sharing information uh, on contracting, on financing. Um, uh, there are groups, I'll just name a few, uh, no Incineration, Frederick uh, County, Maryland, uh, Stafford uh, Citizens for Open Government down in Fredericksburg, uh, Virginia, uh, Zero Waste Prince George's County, Zero Waste San Diego County, etc., etc. Uh, local Sierra Clubs, not all of them, but most of them are very good resources uh, for uh, resources for information on zero waste, recycling, and economic development. Um, <clears throat> LA Shares is a sensational uh, internet uh, run a program for uh, corporate property being shifted over to nonprofits and government agencies. I believe they uh, they transfer about ten million dollars uh, worth of material a year and of course avoid a lot of landfilling. Um, 
urban ore. I've mentioned several times in Berkeley, California. I, is a, on a three-acre site. Uh, it's a site to behold, if I could use that word again. Uh, and I urge you to look at their webpage, and if you can visit, uh, certainly make a visit there. They not only show you what can be done, but if you listen to their materials, they describe the structure uh, of the solid waste industry, how the money flows, and they are quite articulate um, uh, on many issues uh, in the field. Um, uh, the reuse people are a network of maybe 10 or 11 uh, joint venture companies that do deconstruction throughout the country. They're based in Oakland, but they have affiliates throughout the United States. Um, Paul Conant, a wonderful uh, retired professor of chemistry, just uh, wrote a book on zero waste, which I urge you to read. Um, many people, myself included, have added uh, contributed chapters to that. Uh, it's very current, um, and you'll find out what's going on in just about every country in the world as a result of that. Um, uh, in far, as far as getting technical assistance, uh, the, the Institute provides technical assistance. We, uh, if you can't afford uh, our low uh, fees, we help you raise money to, to, to do the work with us. Um, but there are other very good uh, consulting groups, grassroots consulting groups. Uh, their fees are modest, uh, and uh, their work is quite sensational. I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, sound Resource Management out of Belleville, Washington. Uh, Hidden Resources out of San Diego, California. And Recycle Worlds out of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, these are the groups uh, we work with uh, uh, on a regular basis. And um, they are very generous with their information uh, and their time. And uh, these are mission-driven groups uh, that uh, want to succeed. Uh, want your community to succeed. Uh, these are not traditional consulting companies that are in it uh, to make money and go home and uh, don't care about uh, results after that. Um, that is the, uh, the end of uh, this presentation. Uh, I'll remind you again that this is uh, a lecture that was uh, coordinated by the Illinois Recycling Association, thanks to Wynne uh, Coplia. Uh, my name is Neil Seldman. I'm with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance in Washington, D.C. Um, you can uh, get in touch with me through email nseldman at ilsr.org. Uh, you also can follow our webpage, uh, which is, um, uh, excuse me, yes, uh, <laughs> sorry, our webpage is ilsr.org um, as well. And um, we have many, many publications on our webpage. Uh, they're open, uh, free uh, for you to look at. If there are any questions, please give us a call. Uh, we work uh, throughout the country. Uh, we, uh, I personally am working in 30 cities and counties across the country. And um, I will end by saying uh, that the hardest decision to make in recycling is to decide to recycle and then common sense and entrepreneurialism take over. Uh, I wish you luck in your endeavors, and please stay in touch with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the Illinois Recycling Association uh, for continued news about recycling and economic development. Thank you for your time.